I sense the presence of the Lord in this place today. I believe He's come on purpose to help us. And I thank God for His presence. If you'd stand with us, please, for the reading of God's Word. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3 will be our starting place today. Proverbs chapter 3. It's just such an honor to have all of you here, and we hope that you'll come back to the service tonight. We want you here. We need you here. And we're excited for what God wants to do. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for your presence that we sense in this service today. We thank you for the wonderful music, and um, we thank you for this wonderful congregation that has gathered out on this Sunday morning. We're here on purpose, and we're here to hear from heaven, from thy word. Give us the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We're not deserving, we're not able, but, O oh God, our confidence and our trust is in thee today, and for all that you do for us, we'll be careful to give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Life is full of trouble, and we are always checking our pulse and our temperature to see if God will come through for us. And the devil is always throwing shadows on the character of God. Uh, if you'll notice in your mind and in your heart and in your personal relationship with Jesus, uh, the devil across the years and perhaps now is always trying to make God look bad to you. He's trying to say that God isn't good to you, that God doesn't hear your prayers, that God must not like you very much, or he's out to get you, or you've made him so mad that uh, he's never going to answer your prayer, or where was God when you needed him, or where is God right now for whatever you're going through now? You know where God is. Don't let the devil speak those lies to your mind because you know where God is. He has told you clearly in his written word, and when all else fails, every constitution of every country, every um, moral, every written, unwritten law, when, and when anything else may fall in this nation or society or your home or your life, let me promise you that this book will be true and you can trust him. How many of you have these verses memorized that we read this morning? If you do, uh, say them with me. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. You know, Jeremiah 29.11 is up there at the top for me of favorite verses. I have it on my wall on a plaque, maybe a couple different plaques. Uh, that people have given me, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Uh, I love Matthew chapter 6. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air. For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lily in the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God... If God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. I love Psalm 9, verse 10. They that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not 
forsaken them that seek thee. Amen? We know we can trust God, correct? We know we can trust God. Doesn't matter what the devil has been whispering in your mind or your heart this week. Doesn't matter how you may feel on this Sunday morning because of the circumstances of life. Don't let the devil chip away at what you know. You can trust God. And yet, at the first trouble in our life, we often call into question the integrity of God. He who has done so much for us, given us food to eat, place to live, bed to sleep on, shoes on our feet, clothes on our back, family, friends. He's the most important person in our lives, more important than husband or wife, brother or sister, son or daughter, mother or father, but we question him. We can't trust him. When the truth of the matter, and this is what I want to speak about today, the truth of the matter is not can, can we trust God? That's not the question. Can we trust God? That's not the question. The truth of the matter is, and what I want to speak to you about for just a few moments, is can God trust you? I hear a ring doorbell going off somewhere in the congregation. You know, these phones are wonderful things, aren't they? And uh, I heard that sound. Was that you, my wife, Marie? No. Joanne? It was somebody in the back? Oh, it wasn't anybody in here. So my question, did you get that? Can God trust us? Let me ask you, can God trust you when you're all alone? When wife isn't there, husband isn't there, parents are not there, the school teachers are not there, when the preacher's not there, uh, when um, your friends are not there, can God trust you when you are all alone? I thought of um, Joseph, thrown into a pit by his own brothers, then sold into slavery. Uh, but Joseph stayed true to God. He rises in prominence. He, he is... Um, He's smart, he's handsome, placed in a place of incredible temptation. No one would know. No one that mattered would ever know. Uh, his, his friends and family are long past. In fact, his brothers don't even care if he's dead or alive. His father is, is near to his heart, but... He likely will never see him again in his mind. I'll never see my father again. I'll never see the people who believe in me again. He is all alone, placed in a place of incredible temptation. But he resists that temptation. And God immediately blesses him. No, he resists the temptation, and he's thrown into jail to rot perhaps the rest of his life. But God could trust Joseph when he was alone. Let me ask you, can God trust you when you're alone? Let me ask you, secondly, can God trust you in the dark? I was thinking about Daniel taken into captivity. He prayed daily. He is turned in for it. A decree, a false decree is made up. False accusations made, false decree. They're watching to see if Daniel will do what he's always done, knowing full well he will. Daniel knows about the decree. Uh, but he, he trusts God when it would appear that the um, heavens were brass. I don't know that when he prayed those days, if he really felt anything. It seemed like uh, all was against him, oppressed. But Daniel opens his windows as before, and he prays toward Jerusalem. He was a man who would not defile himself with the king's meat. He was a man who would not defile himself with the king's decree. He's thrown into the lion's den. God delivers him. But Daniel could be trusted 
in the dark. What are you going to go through right now in your life? What have you been facing? Can God trust you? Let me ask you next, can God trust you when life isn't fair? I was uh, thinking of, of Job. You read Job chapter 1, and you get down to verse 6. Now there was a day. And I've heard, uh, I've heard different preachers preach on that right there. Now there was a day. It was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And um, Rollin Mitchell said, if the devil can show up at a God board meeting, we shouldn't be surprised if the devil shows up at our board meetings. We have a board meeting scheduled for tomorrow night. The devil is not welcome, and we have a good board, and we pray, and the devil flees. And as far as I know, all of our board members are planning to be there, so we can't, we can't say that one of them is the devil. <laughs> but, uh, but, but the devil showed up at a board meeting about this man called Job and said the reason that Job is serving you is because all that you've done for him, you've given him so many things, you've given him so much. That's why Job serves you. It's a fearful thing to think about, but God, God moved the hedges, didn't he? He moved the hedges. I hope he doesn't move the hedge for you. I hope he never moves the hedge for me. But there's just times when he does. And yet in the discouraging thing of thinking about that the encouraging thing is is that God was in control the whole time and uh, the devil could only go this far and no farther you may be going through it this morning in your life the hedge has come in but I promise you uh, the devil can go this far and no farther and uh, so you know what happened loss of Wealth, loss of children, loss of reputation, his own wife saying, curse God and die. You know, life just isn't fair, that's all there is to it. And just because you become a Christian doesn't make life fair. We're in earth, not heaven, and life isn't fair. But God could trust Job even when life wasn't fair. Can God trust you when life isn't fair? You know, then I thought, uh, <clears throat> can God trust you when you failed him before? Uh, maybe someone here saying, preacher, you're, you're asking me these questions and I have to tell you, God can't trust me. I may be speaking to somebody right here that would say, God can't trust me. I've failed him over and over and over again. God can't trust me. I thought of, I thought of Peter. Jesus knew that uh, Peter was in trouble. He knew and he tried to warn Peter, but Peter was so zealous and so spiritual and so, you know, the reputation and the, everybody knew him as, mm -hmm, you know. And uh, Jesus tried to warn Peter, you know, and, and he tries to warn us in his word. And let me tell you, it doesn't matter who you are from the highest to the lowest. Jesus knows the world we're walking through. He knows your frame, that it's but dust. And Jesus is warning each of us, even on this Sunday morning, hey, I'm with you. I'm here to, the Holy Spirit's here to indwell you. And we're going to make it, and, and it's, you're going to be a conqueror, you're going to be an overcomer. But don't you think that you can stand in your own strength for one minute? Nobody here is brave enough, strong enough, courageous enough to face what life hurls at us. And so Peter but it wasn't, it wasn't long at all. It was actually just, wasn't it maids? Or, it, was just, it was just common people. Said, Didn't, weren't you one of his? Peter, weren't you one of 
Jesus' disciples, weren't you? I mean, it was early on in this matter. It, it wasn't even at the cross yet, hardly. You know, I mean, we're talking about it was early on. Weren't you one of him, his? Peter says uh, he cursed, used words he hadn't used since Jesus called for him. I want to tell you, when you, when you fail God, you start doing things that you never dreamed you'd do. God's so wonderful, isn't he, to bring you out of sin. Sin is so disgusting. You want to rip out, you want to, you want to take a chainsaw and cut down the billboards advertising the beer can with the little, you know, in the ice with the cold drops of uh, condensation on the can and look so refreshing and on a hot summer day, you just want to take a chainsaw and cut the whole sign down. I can tell you one thing, they, they must not be a police officer or a preacher or a, a judge in a courtroom who has to watch little children cry, watch, watch homes break apart. They must not work in the emergency room and see them coming in. Connie Forney works in an emergency room for years. I suppose Connie could tell us lots of stories. My wife's worked in an emergency room for some time. When you see that side of it, you want to take a picture and put that on the billboard right next to it. You know, over the next mountain over in the, near Richfield, Sister Moore, can't remember her first name right now. She was married to Blaine Moore, preacher's wife. And uh, in her retiring years, um, and, and the billboard company told me this themselves. I know this to be true. Every time she saw a beer... Uh, billboard go up, she'd call Lamar Billboard Company and say, we don't want that in our valley. It's done too much bad things. Too many people are dead from car accidents. Too many homes are divided. Too many people have molested other kids in the night and done all sorts of things because they're under the influence of that dreadful stuff. We don't want it here. And so every time she'd call, they, they, they would take them down or else they'd never sell again to that area. We probably ought to call now, wouldn't we? If we see one, call them up. Tell them we don't want it. In uh, Penn's Creek camp this year, I was at Jeremy Fuller, Jacob Martin reminded us again, George Straub, one of the founders of God's Missionary Church, is the reason that Penn's Creek is dry. They used to have taverns galore on Lower Street. And, uh, and he was one of them, helped get it kicked out. The truth is he got it kicked out of Beavertown also. There's a distributor there. But there was once bars and taverns. And when he pastored here at Beavertown Church, he was able to get it out, close them down. I'll never forget when a tavern opened up near here and we requested prayer that God would shut the place down. I'll never forget when somebody walked in the first, uh, first Sunday afterwards, said, did you hear they're going to shut it down? I said, no. Didn't hear that. I'll tell you what, we're, we, we underrate God. We underrate God. He's able to shut down these places. He's able, uh, but, but, but I'm speaking to someone here today that would say, God can't trust me. I've failed too many times. Peter curses, uses words he hadn't used since Jesus called when he was a rough fisherman. For him to follow him, used words he hadn't used since the old life. You fail, you'll do things you never dreamed you'd do. Then the devil says, you're over, you're out, you're done. That's what the devil's about, ruin, subtraction, divide. Get you down, kick you while you're down, and he wants to throw you into hell. He wants to keep you down until the last breath is drawn. He wants to keep you in that failure, that cycle of failure. I'm likely speaking to somebody today that's present or listening who is in a cycle of failure. I'm not going to do it again, but you do it again. You pray and ask God to forgive you, and he does, but then you do it again. I'm speaking to some young person perhaps that's in a cycle of failure, some father, some mother. Some person that's in a cycle of failure, God can't trust you. God can't trust you. You failed him before. The question on this Sunday morning isn't, 
if you can trust God. That's an absolute bedrock foundational truth. The question is, if God can trust you. And let me tell you, Peter found out that God couldn't trust him. When the cock crowed, he had denied three times. But I love the resurrection story. And I was reminded when uh, our group was in Israel again this year, I was reminded of this, that as soon as Jesus was raised from the dead, you know, his thoughts were immediately for his precious people. And he wanted them to know. He wanted them to know because he knows we're human. We're just flesh. We don't understand. He wanted them to know, and so he appears to uh, his followers, and then he says, um, tell my disciples and, and Peter. He knew his name it was like, kind of like at the top of his list. And uh, they've built a church at the spot over there, and it's actually a beautiful church. We've sung in it, and it's right on the Galilee, and it's the place where Jesus comes for Peter. After, G, after Peter has failed and denied three times and Jesus said he would, Peter said he wouldn't, but Peter did anyhow and Peter curses that he never knew him and three times he denies and, and in, this, in this pit of failure and it appears that, that Peter goes back to his old life and not that there's anything wrong with fishing, but that's, that's what Peter had been doing and now he had been now Jesus had saved him and he had been fishing for men but now Peter goes back to fishing for fish but in Peter that old life also meant sin and degradation and loss and, and, and Peter's out trying to fish and of course he can't catch anything without Jesus you're not going to catch anything without Jesus you're not going to do anything for, for that, that counts for eternity they built a church at that place, and it's a neat, neat place. It's one of my favorite places where Jesus appears to Peter. And I want to tell you, you may be in a situation of failure where God's not been able to trust you, but he's walking on the water to you. He's coming to you. He's coming to you in your hopeless, helpless situation because he cares so deeply and he wants to change something on the inside to where you're trustworthy again because you're trusting in a trustworthy God. The question on this Sunday morning is if God can trust you. I want when God looks down at James Plank that he knows by his grace that he can, he can trust me. Trust me in the darkness. Trust me in the nighttime. Trust me when I don't understand or when life is not fair. Trust me in the sorrows. Trust me in the heartaches. Oh God, I don't understand this. Oh God, I'm, I'm hurting. But you can trust me. Job said, even if you kill me. That verse amazes me, doesn't it you? Though you slay me. I'm telling you, I don't know that I have that kind of faith, Brother Gandhi. We were singing about it in the service this morning. And I admitted to you that it felt a little bit like a hypocrite singing that song. One of those verses there. Living by faith and feel no alarm. It's an amazing verse when Job says, Though you kill me, Lord, I'm going to die trusting you. That's how it felt for Abraham, taking his son to the top of the mountain. The knife was in his hand and God stayed the hand. Drastic. The Bible is full of chilling, drastic stories that cut to the bone. But that is life in heaven. We have none of this, but on earth we have all of this. But we have a cross that rises high and a Christ who reigns powerfully and prayer that still moves mountains and the Holy Spirit who still indwells the believer until the God of the universe can look down on his child and say, that's my son. That's my daughter. I am safe with them. 
I can trust them. Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Job chapter 23, Job in verse 7 said, that, or in verse 8, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him, but he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. I believe that there is gold being tried here on a Sunday morning. I believe there's gold being tried in the furnace. You may not understand it, but you stay trustworthy in a trustworthy God. Praise His precious name. Let's stand together this morning.